Before we begin, okay, full disclosure. I had no idea this was a thing. I remember reading an interview with Marv Wolfman about it, but I didn't think it would come out this soon. Originally, I wasn't going to do another review until the Teen Titans Rebirth special was released, but what the heck, I'm bored. Also, one more thing. This story takes place between the events of Teen Titans issue 24 and the soon-to-be-released next week Teen Titans Rebirth special. So now that we've cleared that up, the fans of Raven have been asking for a comic book series on her since the DC special Raven back in 2008 that was strangely written by the same guy who was writing the new miniseries. But who cares, this one is about the new 52 version of her because people somehow care about this version. My name is Biscuit Rebelli and I'm here to review Raven issue number one from DC Comics. Will this miniseries make Raven interesting again or will it once again show us that writers are not creative enough to write a story about her without involving Trigon or anyone associated with him? Let's find out. The comic starts in San Francisco where we see narration captions given to us by Raven. And in the very first one it says, My friend Tim Drake is dead. Wow. First line and it's already a major spoiler. I love how there isn't even an editor's note caption anywhere in the panel, let alone the entire page. For those of us that did not know that Tim Drake is dead and wants to know when this event occurred, go read Detective Comics issue 940. But anyway, in the narration, Raven explains that she wants to prepare for the future, but in order to do so, she must understand her past. It's revealed that her mother waited until she was 17 to tell her that she, the mother, not Raven, has a sister or at least an entire family that she was unaware of. So Raven travels to San Francisco to meet this family and learn more about her mother's side of the family. Also, we see a strange blue ball forming inside a warehouse. Keep this in mind because it will be important later on. Upon arriving to her aunt's house, she is greeted by the family. For the next couple of pages, everything seems like a setup for a family sitcom, but a couple of things important to take note. Raven tells us that when her mother was very young, she ran away from her family. Apparently, her reason was that they believed in a god that she believed does not exist. She also wanted to find a god of her own. When she did, she went out of her way to make sure that she had forgotten about her family. I believe it's to protect them from her god, but we don't know for sure. Moving on, at night we see Raven having a nightmare, mostly because in it she's still wearing that god-awful costume. But in all seriousness, we see in her dream she is being chased by her brothers who have an affiliation with Trigon. They berate her for betraying them, claiming that she was only pretending to be influenced by Trigon. Her pretending to be influenced by Trigon is actually quite interesting and it would make some of her actions in Scott Liddell's run on Teen Titans make sense. However, her reaction in the end of that run is a bit inconsistent. See, here she claims that she is finally free from Trigon's influence, giving us the idea that she was indoctrinated or mind-controlled. Maybe these three didn't know that Raven has broken Trigon's influence? I don't know. Anyway, at the end of her dream, we see she is being awoken by her aunt, who is worried about her. Raven tells her to disregard it and goes back to sleep. The next day, Raven is driven to a high school by her aunt. If you're wondering why Raven is even going to a high school, the comic or the issue itself never really specifies why. But as she's walking around the school's hallways, she suddenly feels pain. Raven thinks that the cause of it is a psychic scan and thinks that her brothers have found her. She throws up at a nearby trash can while three female students start making fun of her. Feeling that she's causing attention to herself, Raven casts an illusion spell on the three female students by making their greatest fear come true. What I love about this moment is not the fact that the greatest fear is to get pregnant, but the fact that the people around them seem to not give a shit when they start to scream. She gets to class and it's revealed through Raven that Power Girl managed to create a life history for her and download it to the school's computer. So no one is aware that she's a superhero. I would also like to point out that she is going with the alias Rachel Roth. From this point on, things get a little bit weird. For example, as soon as Raven sits in her seat, we see this random girl with a creepy smile saying, Hiya Raven, this class is the best. You're gonna be so happy here. Okay. Fifty minutes later, as class is over and Raven's leaving out the door, two students are running towards her just so they can talk to her. Heck, they're so interested to talk to her that one of them even pushes a student out the way. It gets so bizarre that even one of them starts to get a little bit touchy. Bad touch! Bad touch! Stranger danger! They introduce themselves as Madison and Archer and ask if her family is new to San Francisco. Raven responds that she just moved here and that she lives with her aunt and her family. For some reason, these three join in the conversation and what a coincidence! All five of them have family issues. 
But more shenanigans ensue until Raven starts to feel the same pain that she felt when she first arrived to school. She looks around to see a particular female who Raven claims is where the source of the scanning is coming from. All of a sudden, Archer starts to cry in pain as well, claiming that he can't see. Madison starts to freak out, but Raven quickly tells her to go call the paramedics. In the meantime, Raven uses her powers to absorb Archer's pain. Here's a good question. Can anyone actually see Raven's powers in action? I ask this question because I'm under the impression that Raven is trying to keep a masquerade, or make sure that nobody knows about her superhero side or her demonic side. You can see in this panel that Madison thinks that Raven looks like someone she knows, and Raven herself, being a bit nervous, thinking that Madison has figured out that she's a superhero. So obviously she is trying to keep everything about her a secret, but in this panel we actually see her powers form a bit. And it doesn't help in the next panel, a couple of students in the background are holding cameras recording the incident. You could say that Raven is putting up an illusion on everyone, but she never mentions this. It's not really important, but it is something that was on my mind when I was first reading this. So the paramedics arrive to take Archer to the hospital and everyone continues on with their life. At the end of the school, Raven's newly found friends invites her to the carnival. She was going to accept it, but then declines when she sees the female that was causing the scanning earlier. Raven follows her and she manages to catch up to her and grab her arm. Suddenly, the female screams and throws Raven to a tree before shouting out the phrase, not ready. The slam renders Raven unconscious for a bit, at the same time as all of this is occurring, we see a blue ball reform back in the warehouse, but this time a homeless man is standing nearby it. We also get a couple of panels showing Archer in the hospital who is now suffering the same pain he felt back in school. Back to Raven, she wakes up and reveals that when she grabbed the female, she felt no connection to her father, but wonders who is causing all of this. Next, we see Raven's friends leaving the carnival, and strangely enough, the female that Raven encountered earlier is with them. We find out that this female is named Taylor, as one of them asks if she's coming with them on the train. Taylor refuses, saying that she is going to walk around for a bit and that she will call a driver to pick her up. She separates from the group and we see her heading towards the warehouse that we first saw at the beginning of the comic. Taylor enters the warehouse and sees the blue ball. She enters it and the comic ends with Taylor picking up a hammer and using it for a strength tester. We also see the homeless man that we saw earlier riding on something that you would also see at a carnival. Strangely enough, both of them are pleading to make whatever they're doing to stop. Funny enough, that's not the strangest thing about this final page. We later see Raven who is starting to feel the distress that both Taylor and the homeless man are feeling. And then this happens. Honestly, I have no idea what's going on. And the comic just ends right there. Look guys, I'm one of those people who actually did not want Raven to have her own solo comic book series. My reason is that Raven is too boring of a character to even earn a solo series. And in both Scott Liddell's and Will Pfeiffer's versions of Teen Titans, she really didn't do much, especially in Will Pfeiffer's version. However, after reading this, I admit I'm glad she had one, especially with a creative team that can do the character justice, or at least make her interesting. Though one thing I will say is that this comic book series is the most important comic for Raven as a character. Confused? Let me explain. Can any of you who are watching this video tell me who is Raven? As a character, who is Raven? New 52 version, keep that in mind because this comic is following that continuity. I ask this question because even though we've had two comic book series where she's heavily involved in, we have yet to know her that well. Yes, we know she's the daughter of Trigon, but most of the events that happened in Scott Liddell's Teen Titans involving her was because she was influenced by her father. You can say she really wasn't herself when she did those things. Also, let's keep in mind that she was liberated from her father's control towards the end of that run. There was a chance for us to get to know her as a character in Will Pfeiffer's version of Teen Titans, but that run was nothing but filler and a poorly constructed villain. This solo series is probably the best way for us to get to know her as a character. I've learned in just this first issue more things about Raven than Will Pfeiffer's entire run on Teen Titans and most of Scott Liddell's run. I learned a bit about her mother and her relationship with everyone besides Raven. I learned that the real reason why she is staying with her aunt is for escapism escape from being associated with her demonic heritage. Now, I must admit, this is not the first time she's done this. She's done this multiple times in her pre-New 52 version, but at least, at least this comic gives us something about her character, letting us know more about her than what we have gotten in the previous two Teen Titans runs. The writing kind of reminds me of the DC special back in 2008, so I really don't have any complaints about this. That is, except for the ending, 
Now, I know this is the first issue of a mini series. I know that there is five more issues down the line. It's just that when I first came across this page, I was just confused. I know Wolfman is going to explain this later, and it did leave me wanting to buy the next issue. It's just that for a first issue, I don't like being confused, if that makes sense. As for the artwork, at first I didn't like it, but as I reread the comic, it's starting to grow on me. I do love Raven's design. I'll give it that. Well, that's pretty much it for the review. If I have to give this a rating, I would give it an 8 out of 10.